I'm not ever very eloquent, but if I'm stumbling more than normal, I apologize for that. I'm not sure what's going on. We'll trust the, the Spirit of God to do the teaching, though, as we uh, open His Word and read from it. Psalm 139, verse number 19. I love this passage, but I've never actually preached that I know of from this particular section of Psalm 139. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do, I, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Title of this morning's message, The War is Over, But the Rebellion Continues. The War is Over, But the Rebellion Continues. Let's pray. Father, if we had to count on our own ability to learn anything here today or teach anything or be blessed, it would have been better to stay home. But because we know who you are and because what you have already expressed in our lives, we have gathered as your children to be changed, to have your word poured into our lives that would conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus. Father, we came to have you work and we do not take that out of your hands. We ask that you would guide our minds and our mouths, that truth would prevail here, and that your spirit would strive within each heart, doing what's necessary in each life. For we ask this in the precious name of Christ, who purchased all of this for us. Amen. <clears throat> On April the 12th, 1861, the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. It was a 33-hour bombardment that opened the American Civil War. The fighting escalated from that point, and the South seemed to be gaining ground all of the time. By July of 1863, the South had reached its pinnacle and invaded the North in the state of Pennsylvania. The fighting took place in a town called Gettysburg. The first day of fighting was a Confederate victory. The second day, the Confederates were not able to take the high ground. The third day, in an effort to bring the war to a conclusion, 15,000 Confederates were to attack the center of the northern lines. It was... It was a very dangerous undertaking. They felt if they could break the northern lines at that point, the war would be lost because Washington would be threatened and we would ha the North would have to sue for peace. So they attacked. General Longstreet, who was overseeing the entire operation, had been given these orders and was not willing, not really behind them. He said... No 15,000 men ever made can take that hill. I don't know if you've ever been there. I was at Gettysburg quite a few years ago. It is a piece of ground that is rising about a mile without a tree on it, and at the top is a stone wall. Yeah. Completely open. Pickett was in charge of the, the, uh, the attack, and up the hill they went. Before the, the attack... The Confederates opened up with the artillery barrage. It was the loudest noise ever heard on the American continent up to that point. It was heard, I think, several a hundred miles away. I think they heard the boom from the cannons uh, before Pickett's charge. Opposing them were 6,500 uh, blue soldiers up behind the stone wall. When the Confederates started up the hill, the, the northern artillery started firing, and when they got within range, 6,500 muskets from behind a stone wall began firing. 
The Confederates melted like snow on a hot day, and those that got to the top were just immediately captured. Very few actually got to the top. It broke the back of the Confederacy. They never recovered from that. The wagon train that took the, the wounded away was 20 miles long of wounded men from this attack. The Confederacy would never recover from that, but the war was not over. For two more years, they would fight. Having no chance of actually winning, they fought on. In April, no, nope, sorry, August, nope, I'm sorry, I was right the first time. In April 9th, in 1865, Lee surrendered the army at Appomattox Courthouse. This basically ended the Civil War. However, some refusing to accept that surrender fought on. They fought on as renegades and became a real problem for both the North and the South. They were bands of outlaws that uh, they uh, were in rebellion that continued. Now, this is not unusual. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. They had shocking success. They made, a, made very serious progress in the Pacific until June of 1942. At the Battle of Midway, the Japanese invasion of the Pacific was halted and their loss was basically predetermined at that moment. They were continually driven back until August of 1840, I'm sorry, 1945 when we dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and Japan sued for peace. However, some fought on. The last World War II Japanese soldier to surrender was in 1974. 29 years after the war was over, this man was still fighting. He was still in rebellion in 1974 and actually surrendered at that moment. In a similar way, we find the rebellion against God. Let's walk through the steps here. Lucifer, as his angel name was, led a rebellion in heaven against God. We do not know for sure when this took place or how many of the angels went with him. We do know that they were thrown out of heaven. His first attack on earth was in the Garden of Eden. It was a sneak attack on an unsuspecting Eve. She fell to the deception and Adam chose to join as well. This rebellion spread and gained momentum until it was so widespread that every thought on the earth was only evil continually. It's at that point that they suffered a major setback this rebellion, because God wiped the earth clean. He wiped out those opposing forces and brought the population of the human race back to eight people with a great flood. The devil began again to build the rebellion, and soon the human race was building a tower in defiance of God. The rebellion suffered another setback at that moment when God totally um, changed the human, the, the uh, language. He confounded their languages and they could not participate one with another. This rebellion gained and lost ground in nations and in countries and in individuals. God used circumstances, he used prophets, he used kings to prevent the rebellion from ever totally encompassing the human race. Finally, as it was predicted, God the Son would be sent to this earth and be born as a man on this planet. The devil decided to seize the chance. 
If the Son of God could be corrupted or destroyed, the rebellion would be complete and a success. His first attempt was through Herod to try to destroy this infant child. It was not successful. We do not know what all happened and what attacks were made on the Lord as he grew, for this, is, this period of his life is silent. But we do know that when the Lord started his earthly ministry, that the attacks on him were relentless. Using his old tactics, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the, the Lord was tempted, who was at the point of starvation, to eat bread. He was offered, when he owned nothing, all the kingdoms of the world. He tried, the, the devil tried to convince the Lord to u, do into useless demonstrations of power, trying to corrupt the Son of God. He was unsuccessful in this. In his mind, if the rebellion were to succeed, the Son of God must be destroyed. So he went about to bring that to pass. He stirred up envy in the chief elders and uh, the chief priests and Pharisees. He stirs up the desire to rule in Pontius Pilate. He puts greed into the heart of Judas Iscariot. When the stage is properly set, Judas betrays the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. The chief priests condemn him out of jealousy and send him to Pilate. And Pilate, who knows he's innocent, but desiring to maintain power, sentences, sentences the Lord to death. Now, as this rebellion is taking place, can you not hear the forces of evil rejoicing as Christ is beaten by the soldiers? Can you not hear the jeers of the rebellion as he is led through the streets? Can you not imagine the exultation in Satan's heart as the sin sinless Son of God is nailed to the cross? The crowds are jeering. Now to the devil, the darkness on the earth, the earthquake, the it is finished were all signs of victory. There were a few strange things that had happened that he could not account for. The Lord still had a few followers, but these could be eliminated very shortly. In 1 Peter, we actually find out that the angels do not understand the plan of salvation. Had they understood the plan of salvation, this would not have taken place. The devil would never have tried to have the Lord crucified and put to death had he known what was actually taking place. What he thought was his great victory in this rebellion was actually his total defeat. Three days after Christ is put into that grave, he came out of that grave. He had conquered death and hell. Sin that, had, that was the grip on the rebellion on men's hearts was dealt with. Christ had become sin for us. We are told the sting of death is sin. The reason we fear death is because sin will separate us permanently from God. And the strength of sin is the law. God's law demands that sin be punished. We fear death because God's law demands that our sin be punished. But in that same passage, death is swallowed up in victory because he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me state it ba very basically. The war is over. Christ had his heel bruised, but he has crushed the serpent's head. Yeah. What the devil thought was final victory was absolute, total, and complete defeat. My friend, the war is over. Yes. But like history shows us, the rebellion continues on. The war is over. But the rebellion continues. Now let's look at our passage of scripture and find out where each of us are at in this situation.
19 says, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's make a few quick points here before we leave today. Number one, the leaders of the rebellion will be punished. The leaders of the rebellion will be punished. At this moment, many of the demons are already suffering in hell. In not too distant future, all of them will be. Revelation number, chapter number 12 tells us the devil knows that his time is short. He found out very quickly that what he had done had sentenced him. He had finished his own rebellion. And very soon, he will be permanently judged and put away. You know, there are people today who are still following, abs actually openly following the devil. This is a huge mistake. Because you are following someone who has already been defeated and slated for destruction, slated for eternal punishment. To follow him is a ridiculousness because he has already been defeated. The leaders of the rebellion will be punished. Number two, this is a little difficult to take, but it is the truth. Number two. All of us have participated in the rebellion. All of us have participated in the rebellion. It is easy to throw rocks at other people, but the fact remains, all of us have participated, some more, some less, in the rebellion against God. What else can you say about your sin? You knew the law of God. You knew exactly what He wanted. And yet, you chose to defy his authority in your life. You went and did whatever you wanted to do. My friend, that is rebellion. Yes. We all participated in the rebellion against God. Number three, we are now faced with a choice. We are now faced with a choice. My friend, the war is over. The rebellion that you took part in is, that war is over. The rebellion is a failure. And you are left with a choice. When Lee was at, which was a general over the south, when Lee came to Appomattox Courthouse to surrender, the terms of the surrender were very basic and plain. The terms were unconditional surrender. This is what they said Grant's initials of his name meant. It wasn't, it was a Ulysses S. Grant, but they called him U.S. Grant. Unconditional surrender Grant. What did this mean? What it meant was, you come in here and do exactly what we say. That's the terms. No if, ands, or buts about it. You come in and lay your guns down and do exactly what we say. That's the terms of the surrender. Anything less than that is rebellion and we're, we're going to deal. You have the right to, we're going to allow you to come in and lay your guns down and do what we say. No if, ands, or buts. That was the terms of the surrender. My friend, this is God's terms. This is how you must come to God. The war is over. The terms are unconditional surrender. Not, I'll come and keep my life kind of the way I want it. I'll surrender, but I'm only coming this way. I'll surrender, but I refuse to do that. I'm sorry, but those are not the terms. The terms are unconditional surrender, or you are still in rebellion. It's that simple. The terms 
our unconditional surrender. I don't know if you know any about what took place there. The, when they met at Appomattox, Lee surrendered to Grant. The terms were unconditional surrender. It was one of the most gracious things that ever took place in military history. What Grant said was, lay your guns right there and go home. Unbelievable. They had been in rebellion for four years at countless millions of dollars. And Grant said, lay your gun down and go back home, get back to work. No prison, no punishment, no fines. Go back home. Unbelievable graciousness. My friend, God was far more gracious than that. If you will surrender unconditionally, He will cleanse you from this rebellion. The debt was paid by His Son in full. Not only does He cleanse you, but He takes you into His family. He remakes you on the inside. He provides for your every need. And He prepares for you a place to live with Him for all of eternity. Can you imagine? You have been involved in a rebellion against God. And when you come to Him in absolute surrender... He treats you with unfathomable love. You have a choice. Just like the soldiers at Appomattox. Will you, un will you surrender unconditionally? Or are you going to fight on? That's your choice. Will you surrender unconditionally? Or will you fight on? Number four, some choose to fight on. Some choose to fight on. The Civil War was over, but many chose to continue fighting and became renegades. It is that way today. Look at verse number 20. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. So it is today. Some people fight on. Actually, right now at Meyer Hall, there's a girl who's not allowed to come to Bible study. She's only 13 years old. But when she comes to Bible study, she curses the name of God. She blasphemes the name of God when she comes to Bible study, so they do not allow her to come. My friend, the planet is filled with people who are in rebellion against God. Is it you? Is it you? Sitting in this room, there are several, maybe many, some openly rebelling, some secretly rebelling, but you have not unconditionally surrendered to God. Did you know that the rebellion against God will not end? It's interesting. The rebellion against God will not end. In Matthew chapter number, in, in, in Matthew, forget that there's actually three places there in Matthew, it says that in hell there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know what that gnashing of teeth is? It is people angry with God and still rebelling against Him. Isn't that sad? They had a chance to come back to God. But they refused that. They refused to surrender. And they will be in hell for all eternity. And this is not an easy thing to say, my friend. But they will be in hell for all of eternity still in rebellion against God. Still angry with God. 
I cannot think of anything sadder than that. The rebellion does not end. If you at this moment are rebelling against God, that is the future that you are choosing. When will your rebellion end? When will your rebellion end? It continues right on into hell for an eternal damnation. When is your rebellion going to end? If you sit here in rebellion this morning, why? The war is over. The conditions are unconditional surrender. But the grace in which you are met is absolutely unbelievable. Why would you stay in rebellion? Number five. We should hate the rebellion with a perfect hatred. We should hate the rebellion with a perfect hatred. Look at verse number 21 and 22. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Uh, sorry, verse number 21. I, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. These are some hard words, are they not? What do they mean? Well, they're fairly simple, actually. Ask yourself. God hates the rebellion perfectly, does he not? Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. He hates the rebellion perfectly. So we must hate it like he hates it. I fear often that God's people do not hate the rebellion like he hates it. How does God hate it? He loves the sinner, but hates the sin. God loves the sinner. He hates the rebellion perfectly. He loves the sinner, but hates the sin. I fear that often God's people do not hate the rebellion that way. Very often, we like the sin. The system that the world has set up, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we often participate in at some level with that system that we are supposed to despise, and we participate in it. And all too often, we hate the sinner. We look at a person dominated by sin, and we despise them when we should love them. Look, we were all part of the rebellion. Right? We were all part of the rebellion. So to look at someone else and throw rocks at them, look in the mirror. We were all part of the rebellion. And now, what do we do? We hate the rebellion. But we love the people. And we go to God as one sinner for another. Not, I'm this amazing person coming for these downcast. No, we go to God as a former rebel begging for the current rebel. We love the sinner but despise the rebellion. David said, I, I hate them with a perfect hatred. He is hating them the way that God hates them, which is to love the sinner, but to hate the sin. And number six, we must watch our own hearts lest the rebellion creep back in. We must watch our own hearts lest the rebellion creep back in. I do find this passage interesting. In verse number 21 and 22, David just takes a stand against the rebellion. I hate them with a perfect hatred, he says. But look at verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. O Lord, is there rebellion in my heart? That's what he's asking. I hate that rebellion. Oh, Lord, look in my heart. Has some of it slipped back in? Is there some rebellion in my heart? I do not want that, oh God. Search me. 
we must all be careful lest rebellion slip back in to our lives. I read an illustration this week from F.B. Meyer that was helpful to me. He asked, does the Lord have the key to your heart? He said, yeah, he's probably got the key to the front door. If you know the Lord, yeah, he's got the key to the front door. And he gets in. And yeah, he's got the key to the, 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 the rooms in your house. He's got all the keys to all the rooms in the house. He said, but how about that small drawer in your dresser? Does he have the key to that? That one item in your life that's locked away. My friend, this is not unconditional surrender. When you surrender the Lord, you hand over all the keys to all of your life and say, search me and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. There is nothing held back. And this is what God's people need. Does God have all the keys to your life? Or are you still in rebellion? The war is over. The rebellion continues. Which side are you on? Let's pray.